What is going on my Creation RNs? As you can hear in my voice, I'm still kind of getting over this sickness. However, I finally feel better enough to record a video for y'all. I know I've gotten many requested videos. One I particularly want to talk about is what do you do when your patient codes? Absolutely the worst feeling in your life, ER, inpatient, wherever it is that you are when a patient codes. I personally, in the beginning, when I became a graduate nurse, had a hard time dealing with it because, you know, as a new nurse and as having never worked with anybody who has passed away, you feel like it's almost your fault. And it's not. Unfortunately, you know, life just kind of happens. And there are times where it could be uh, medical related and the reasons that they passed away. However, a lot of times these patients are just very, very ill. And it's not your fault. It's not anybody's fault. It's just, it's, it's death, you know? And I'm going to go into another video about death and dying and the grieving process and things of that nature. However, I'm not going to discuss that in this video because it's just going to be something kind of different. So what do you do when you walk in and your patient has coded? Good morning, Mr. Smith. My name is Jennifer. I'm going to be your nurse today. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate your pain? Mr. Smith? Mr. Smith? Oh, no! So there is going to be times that you're going to walk in and your patient may either not be breathing or they may not um, have a heart rate. And the number one rule that I cannot stress enough for graduate nurses is do not run away. Um, our instinct when something like that happens is we want to run away. And you can't. You can't run away. You have to stay with the patient. Um, you, of course, if you've taken ACLS or your BLS, you know you want to kind of tap your patient, are you okay, are you okay? And then you want to check um, for a pulse. If you notice that your patient does not have a pulse and they are not breathing, like I said, do not run away. Your first thing you're gonna do is call for help. <sighs> I need help! And when I say call for help, what I mean is, is you were gonna scream, I need some help in here, and I wouldn't use the words in here, I would use whatever room you're in. So if you're in room 10, I need some help in room 10, normally in the ER, really anywhere that you work, but my experience is the ER, you're going to have some people that are going to come running for you. Immediately, when you know this patient is not breathing and they have no heart rate, you're going to want to start chest compressions. Like I said, you're not leaving that patient. The time is very critical when a patient is coding. So immediately. Starting chest compressions, got this. If you need help, I know that they teach you in school that um, staying alive is like a good one. The ha, 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 staying alive, staying alive, ha, 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 staying alive. No? Okay. <laughs> so like I said, chest compressions, make sure you're doing above 100 beats per minute. Um, that is the new ACLS guidelines. And if you get tired and you need help, have someone tag in. So in the ER, because again, my experience is the ER, you as the primary nurse become the recorder. So in other words, you take over that code. Meaning you start assigning roles, you start looking for people for help. So normally, specifically in the ERs I've been to, what we do is either our technicians or our paramedics are the ones that are actually doing the chest compressions. Um, normally, in a best case scenario, I like to have two or three um, people to kind of switch off. Um, two at the very least, because once one does two minutes of compressions, they switch off and then the next person does two minutes of compressions. And again, you're going to assign roles. So say you have an extra paramedic, you're going to assign a role for that paramedic to hook the patient up to the monitor, hook them up to the crash cart so we can see their rhythm. You're going to want to assign a nurse to be the nurse that's going to administer medications. Epinephrine, lidocaine, I mean anything that you need, you, that nurse needs to be knowledgeable about what's in the cart, where to find it, 
how much to give the patient, et cetera, and so forth. So you've got your medication, you've got your compressions, you've got the person hooking them up to the um, machine, you've got people starting your IVs, you've got people taking blood, um, people, you have a runner. Most importantly in a code is to have a runner because that person is literally going to run and get you everything. Because sometimes your patients code and they're not in a room or they're not in your trauma room or they're not in the correct room that they need to be in. <laughs> so you have to have somebody running to get your stuff, your chest tubes, your um, RSI kits if they plan on intubating the patients. Um, you know, anything and everything. There's so many different tools, your intubation tools. I mean, sometimes you might have to restrain a patient if the patient comes back from coding because, I mean, there's a lot going on. If they have return, um, what we call ROSC, which is um, return of spontaneous um, circulation, sometimes they come back and they get a little frantic and sometimes you have to restrain that patient to calm them down. There's so many different things that you need. So you need to have all those people in your team. And of course you need your doctor. I cannot tell you how many times I have been in a code where nobody knew where the doctor was at. And it shouldn't happen that way, but it does. And when that happens, especially if you're on the floor, because you may not have a doctor on the floor initially, you have to know your ACLS and your BLS, specifically your ACLS so that you know medications and when to start. If you're on the floor and you don't have a physician, my number one tip is to call a rapid response. Um, those are specifically trained nurses. I believe they have to have so many years of ICU training in order to qualify to be um, rapid response nurses. And um, they know their ACLS. So you are perfectly fine with a rapid response nurse until you know a physician or somebody comes in that room. You want to have respiratory in there. Like I said, if they plan on intubating a patient, you need to have respiratory. Um, you want to make sure that x-ray is aware that this patient's here in case they need to take a picture of um, making sure that the trach's where it's supposed to be, making sure that the chest tube's where it's supposed to be. All of that information needs to be clarified um, prior to, you know, sending the patient to ICU or whatever the case may be. Also, if they place a central line, which happens a lot of times, you need to have x-ray there to um, take an x-ray of the central line, make sure that it is where it's supposed to be because a lot of times, again, if the central line is not where it's supposed to be, you cannot use it until you have confirmation by a radiologist that it is where it's supposed to be. What do you do once the code is finally over? Regardless of the outcome, if the patient does not come back, if the patient does come back, what do you do once the code is over? Um, some hospitals, depending on where you work, will hold a debriefing process. That debriefing process just kind of goes over, you know, what happened, what could have been done differently, you know, emotions, things of that nature. I remember after my first code, um, we lost the patient and it was very, very difficult on me because again, I was a new graduate nurse. I had never really dealt with death before and it was very traumatic. And I went into the bathroom and literally cried for 20 minutes. And I was very fortunate enough to have staff around me that understood and was there for me. But it's it's very telling and it is very humbling, you know, when these experiences happen. I don't want to get too much into postmortem care because that could be a topic in and of itself. But the only thing that I recommend to my graduate nurses or even to my experienced nurses that maybe haven't dealt with death is to respect the family and to respect the body. Um, I have been in codes where we have done postmortem care and the staff was very disrespectful of the body and I had to walk out because it is not and never will be acceptable to be disrespectful of somebody who has passed. End of story. That's just my view on it. Um, but just be respectful. There's a lot of families who have different religious preferences. Um, or just personal preferences, you know, living will preferences, things of that nature. Just make sure that you're following family wishes as well as the patient's wishes. Um, and just, just re be respectful up until, you know, they leave your care and they eventually go to the morgue. I didn't want to make this video a Debbie Downer, but, you know, when you talk about codes, it's, it's very difficult to talk about, especially as a graduate nurse when you 
as me, as a graduate nurse, didn't really have a whole lot of experience with death, it becomes very telling and it becomes very scary. And I kind of want to take that off and I kind of want to poke fun at it a little bit because it is a very scary situation. But if you know what to do and you know the procedures, you're going to be good. Nothing to worry about. I really hope this video was helpful to you. Please give me a thumbs up and let me know that this video was helpful. Make sure you subscribe. I like to post as many videos as possible. Now that I'm finally feeling better, you know, I'm trying to definitely post as much more and answer a lot of questions that I get frequently. Um, make sure that you follow me on my Instagram and Facebook. I also have a blog at creationrn.com where I go more into detail regarding um, the topics that I talk about here. But I hope you all have a wonderful day and I look forward to you in my next video. Bye!